Welcome everyone to the Brand Builders Podcast. It is me, Biff Reynolds. No. What's Sorry. up? Sorry, that's my WWE alter ego, Biff Reynolds. Uh, it is me, Tom Montgomery. Um, and I'm here with my most illustrious co-host slash host, uh, Preston, Preston Rangsnerford? They call me Shredder in the ring. Ooh, Shredder. I like it. Shredded lettuce coming down the back. A little bit of, little bit of shredded Senor lettuce. Senor Lechuga. <laughs> uh, it is a pleasure to see everyone here on the internet today. Um, and uh, first off, how is everybody doing? Okay. Nice. Good. Yeah. Good. Tough Good week. To yeah, okay. Got it. Got it. Well, hopefully we can help with that. So today... Preston and I had the genius idea um, to uh, to talk o- talk about something that's kind of been top of mind for us for the last couple of months, and um, we'll see how the conversation goes. But particularly, the prompt here was, "Hey, let's rethink how we might have um, gone about building chubbies." Um, uh, were we back at the kind of few million dollar run rate um, uh, scale in terms of top line revenue? Um, we were growing, um, but we were still wet behind the ears um, and had a lot of pain to come um, uh, in the subsequent years um, that followed our first couple of years in business. How might we have approached that time period differently knowing what we know now? Um, and um, particularly in light of kind of a modern toolkit and some of the things that are um, happening in the world of automation and uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning and things like that, how might we go about building a brand today? Because, you know, our, re- our most recent experiences at Chubby's and at Solo were managing businesses on the scale of hundreds of millions of dollars of, of um revenue and, and thinking through kind of more scale problems. And it's fun to kind of think through, Hey, what about at the much, much smaller scale, but still on the rise and still kind of very fast growth rates. Um, so that's the topic, um, is, um, uh, with what we know now with the world as, as it is today, um, how might we approach building a brand and building a really highly profitable, um, uh, long-term growth story, um, um, where we're we building today. So with that, um, I will open it up to you, Preston, with the first question. Um, how do you think about what's what's a framework that comes to mind for you? What are the things that come to mind for you when I when I introduce that topic of, hey, imagine we're we're we are running Chubbies. We've just started it last year. We're we're on a run rate of about of a few million bucks. We've got the world ahead of us. We're growing. We're investing in meta, we're investing in kind of the modern channels, finding success. Um, how, how, might, how might you rethink the way um, we would be building? Great question. And I think my answer from a framework perspective would be do whatever I can to become a star on the WWE. And if that doesn't pan out, then then we can actually talk about uh, strategies and tactics. But that would probably be my my first. Maybe approach. another episode that is basically cracking WWE. Exactly. We can go through that. Exactly. What the, yes. What are the minor league circuits that are the that are the best feeders into WWE? Exactly. What's the workout great routine that Netflix, most promotes? Uh, the special body? on that actually. Yeah, Ooh. I think it's called the the West Valley wrestling anyways some good stuff there and i've already got it mapped out so when we talk about it i'll have a lot to say outside of that however there are a few things that we might do and what we might say is just just that this is somewhat of a fun thought exercise to because when we were at numbers like this goodness it was nearly a decade ago or more Obviously, a lot has changed, but as we went through this experience, we 
do think that a lot of the learnings and mistakes that we made can still be applicable to today's brand builder. And uh, so I think the hope is that, that we can provide some info on what, given that we made effectively every mistake in the book, some things that you might apply on a go forward basis. So from a framework perspective, a couple of the things that, that stood out to us were the, a few things. One, sort of like the power of let's isolate the things that are critically important so that we can allocate our time, energy, resources, dollars to these things, particularly around the, what is the wheel that we do need to reinvent and what are the things that we just simply do not. And the four things that we sort of isolated and wanted to discuss around this idea of sort of like what matters. And we sort of thought some of them are related, of course, but just this notion of creative one, two storytelling, three content and four product. Obviously the first three somewhat related, but there are some specific things that we can um, talk about there, particularly as it relates to distribution of content, et cetera, et cetera, how best, how we think we might approach it if we were doing it again. Um, so yeah, th those are, that's sort of like the framework that we're using within, as you said, the context of holy smokes, the possibility for scale and leverage, uh, whether it be from AI machine learning, et cetera, or just, just basic tools that have been created that aren't necessarily technically AI, um, pretty powerful. And the idea that there's, as in everything, a balance. There are some ways that the use of these sorts of tools can can kind of be difficult. Uh, difficult being sort of like a, a euphemism for maybe uh, less, less productive. Uh, maybe there are some things that um, where automation can maybe take you in, in the wrong direction or, you know, things like that, that I think can become relatively obvious when you try some of these things, but, but I think sort of long veins of some of the things that, that, that we have learned that are just a part of growing a business, figuring out how to grow, how best to grow. Um, maybe even trying to ignore what other people are doing as a definition of success, fighting the, the shiny object, the grass is greenerism, all of these sorts of things. I think that'll sort of, guide a little bit of what we talk about today. But, um, you know, I think, Thomas, maybe to, to kick it off, I'm just sort of curious to get your thoughts on, as you think about these ideas of content, creative, storytelling, product, you know, particularly in the, in the range of, let's say, your three to 15 million in annual revenue, like, how, how would you think about, how would you think about it? How would you approach it? Um, what are some of the things that you might do differently from what our previous experience was? And let's just walk through some of those thoughts. Take a walk. You might be on mute. Let's take a little walk. Let's take a little meander. Let's go on um, a little meander. Let's Good see part. here. Uh, I think... I think the way that I, so the way that I thought about this, um, is, um, clarify what you need to be excellent at, um, and then invest your resources there. And outside of that, um, uh, minimize your resource investment. Now it doesn't mean don't invest in these things. Cause a lot of these things are kind of blocking and tackling, but it's like, what are the things you need to be best in the world at in building a brand? Um, and what are the things that you can be like everybody else yep. and, and, and win because what you're infusing into that being like everybody else is, um, is best, best in class. Um, and so, yeah, the first element of that to me is this, like, is, um, storytelling brand slash creative slash content. It's all wrapped into one bucket for me. Um, that's like that DNA of being creative, that spark of thinking about everything and everything, every touch point as con as a content opportunity, as a content experience, 
um, which, you know, what is content, but, um, an opportunity to delight someone, leave them with a lasting emotional impression. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of what we're all about what we talk about, which is like quote unquote brand. Um, uh, and then the flip side of that, also a very creative endeavor is making sure that your product is differentiated, satisfies a white space. And a lot of times we talk about this as kind of creatively, you're hitting an emotional white space. Product wise, you're hitting kind of market white space or a jobs to be done white space, both wildly important. And those are the things that we need to be like best in class at from a like create creativity perspective. Um, and the way I think about the best teams is they're like, you know, kind of, um, on one hand, incredible artists, incredible creatives. And on the other hand, also incredible scientists, hypothesis havers, um, but who then are guided by experimentation. Um, and, um. And so that's the DNA to really, really populate the business with. And at every position, um, have a shading of that in one way or the other. Um, and then I think the other piece is, um, at the leadership level, having a wild amount of discipline, a wild amount of focus, um, is critical. Um, and so those are kind of the, the DNA things. And then they like tactic, like are a, a more strategic, like, what am I trying to do with this business? I think we also had that a little bit wrong where, um, uh, at Chubby's I think we implicitly thought that like, Hey, when you're building a business, you have two outcomes, you get acquired or you IPO. Those are the two. And I think when you look at, um, the world of brands, that's not <laughs> super common. Um, and so there was a third option that I didn't realize was on the table is build a kick-ass profitable business that you own a massive chunk of, um, and you have control of that spits out a lot of cash, um, that you dividend out to shareholders, um, and you create an awesome existence, um, for your employees and for your company. Like the idea, I don't know why, but the idea of just staying an awesome, excellent private company didn't occur to me when I, when we were starting Chubby's, when we were at this stage, <laughs> like I as we got close. farther and farther along and saw, well, like we're generating a lot of profit here. That became like a, a really interesting opportunity that I wish we would have in the early days understood more about. Um, and so to me, what's foundational there is Profit is really important and not just momentary pop profit, but then building the engine that drives growing and growing and growing and growing profits, right? Like that's our role. Um, and that wasn't obvious to me um, when we started and when we were at the kind of $5 million stage. Um, I think we were still very much in this like exit mindset. Back then exits were very thought of as like revenue, op like a revenue optimization sort of game. And I don't know the degree that to which that's changed or not. I think obviously the, the public markets um, are rewarding much more profitability. Um, but um, but I still think there's this like intrinsic motivator to grow revenue. Um, and I would kind of looking back fully stop that. And so then it's like, okay, how can I how can I use that to build an engine that creates long term profit growth? Um, and so that was like the basis with which, um, I thought about it and then, um, and then it is, okay, what are the fundamental elements of that engine that I have to get right? And so we talked about kind of brain and creative, um, and I think there's a bit of like DNA and then there's a wild amount of experiment, experiment, experiment. And one of the things that I think is an interesting lens to think through the, the kind of content, like brand creative problem is pick the things you want to be the best in the world at. Um, even within that domain, right? It's not that you're always going to be, you're going to be the best at running billboards and TV ads and social and packaging and on product content experiences and in, uh, inbox content experiences, um, and direct mail and everything else. It's like, where do you, at 5 million or at a 5 million scale, you don't have a hundred people working at the business, right? So how do you focus on those things you're, you're choosing to be excellent at? And how do you, how do you know what that, what the right thing is? Um, but I think it's useful to think through what are those elements? And so when we think about what are these opportunities you have to infuse the customer experience with quote unquote brand or storytelling, that is that thing that leaves a lasting impression and optimally creates shared, uh, a shareable experience for a customer. So 
they have an awesome customer support experience that oftentimes can turn into a shared, uh, a shared content experience where they say they tweet or they go post on Instagram. Hey, just had the most interesting, awesome, cool experience with the, uh, Chucky's customer support crew. Um, uh, also they'll, your inbox experience is something the, the kind of unboxing, the opening experience is something that can be shared. Um, a lot of like YouTubers will do unboxing experiences of interesting and cool brands. Um, that's something you can invest time and attention into, um, social content, building content to go, to grow on Instagram, TikTok, etc. You can invest there big budget, like TV oriented content. You can invest there. It's typically harder for smaller brands, but you can do that and you get excellent at that. And how to do that on a budget, um, yep. direct mail, Would you, print to, to that point though, I'm vibing with this a bunch and I want to get your thoughts here. On these topics of picking the things that you're going to be the best in the world at, would you, how how would that approach have been different from uh, the Chubby's experience, if at all? I think that um, that at the kind of five million dollar stage, um, I think there was an element of that that like we were naturally pretty focused on social. Um, I think we were also naturally pretty focused on inbox. Mm -hmm. Like I think those were the two that we were probably the most focused on. And if it was outside of that, we probably weren't going to be the best at it. Um, but we did a lot of work on how can we make this kind of unboxing experience really interesting and shareable and magical. Um, and how can we, um, make social content that is shared, um, and powerful. Now that may be because those are like the cheapest ones. Um, and so I think there's an element of that that like um, we we scrapped into, and that may like I wonder if like that's indicative of like where a lot of brands should kind of look to start is like how to innovate on um, those content experiences uh, in their specific category. Um, I think what we what we could have done differently in terms of like creative focus is just been way more structured with that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think we were like, Hey, everybody in the company, you know, here are the things we're going to, we're going to really nail. And I also think that particularly when it came to like the unboxing experience, we didn't have great KPIs there. We didn't have a great understanding of like, right. what was that doing for us? Um, right. And so we went through, we used to uh, drop a, a free, like surprise gift with purchase inbox. Um, in the early days, we didn't have a great way to keep that um, and maintain that, even though there's like an intuitive notion that like, hey, that's cool. And we see content getting shared. We see that we didn't have an intrinsic understanding of like, the value of that. Why is that right. important? Um, and so I think like, when it comes to some of these more uh, less like kind of you have these direct um, attribute, like when you're posting on social, you can see shares, you can see likes, you can see views, things like that. Um, that's very immediate feedback where you're like, oh, I'm doing well or I'm not. With an inbox insert, you're not getting that so much. Like you try a new one and it's not, um, it's not so obvious. You have to do bold outs, you have to do LTV testing. And while we did those things, we probably weren't excellent at that, like from a data perspective at that scale. Um, and so that's probably the one that like, um, I would have audited a bit yep. harder. I mean, how do you, um, how would you think about, so, okay, I'm, I'm doing f five this year and I'm trying to figure out a couple things. One, how much should I be leaning on agencies from the perspective of creative and media buying? How much should I be spending on allocating dollars to time people focus to creating video content, social content that might not necessarily be the exact asset that you throw in your ASC campaign from a capital allocation, resource allocation perspective, knowing what you know now, how would you give thoughts or approach the idea of sort of like agency versus in-house allocation of resources on creating this this video content versus just iterating the heck out of these static assets maybe yes to all but yeah how would you think about that if you were to do it again now yeah 
I, I think my take is more nuanced because I think that um, different brands and founders and leadership teams have different um, uh, superpowers. But I think there is a non-negotiable element of that that is you still have to create awesome product, one, and two, you still have to create these shareable content experiences. But the degree to which um, I'm excellent at creating video content um, doesn't have to be the currency of my brand. I could be excellent at creating like that unboxing experience of designing that. I could be excellent at designing print and using that as the area where I really stand out and sending out catalogs and mailers and things like that. I think it's choosing what your superpower is and making sure that you're, you own that, you have a team in-house to own that because that enables you to be iterative. Um, a lot of times when you're working with an agency, you tend to be a little bit less iterative. There are some great agencies mm -hmm. out there who are, uh, but just the costs are double, right? Like they have yeah. to make their margin on the creative um, and um, and then you pay the, the raw cost of the creative. And so just, just by that math, effectively cut the, the shots on goal you can take in half. Um, and I don't think you can afford that um, in the areas where you want to be super powerful. So it's like, pick your superpower on that. If video is not your superpower that you've chosen, then, then you have two options. One is enlist an agency. I might suggest that you're looking for, um, you're not necessarily looking for um, an agent, you're looking for an agency that produces the content themselves, right? Um, that's what I would suggest so that they're not marking up costs, you're paying directly to the, the team that's actually gonna produce content. Um, and, um, and so, so as opposed to a team that comes up with a creative idea and then goes and hires the whole other team that, that otherwise you'd be using to produce the content, if only you had the idea sort of thing. Right. Instead, I would, um, find a team that can do all of that together, um, and make sure that they can translate your superpower into the great video creative, um, or vice versa, right? The great packaging, if you have great video creative, but you're not mm -hmm. excellent, like kind of package design stuff, um, or you don't want to be excellent at that sort of thing. Um, so that's one option is hire the agency. Yep. I would just acknowledge that the trade-off is you're going to, you, you're going to be less efficient, right? From a capital perspective, but the advantage of an agency is, um, one resource growth and diminishment, right? Um, they've got a team that they can quickly add bodies to. Um, and if it's not working, you can cut it without needing to go through a performance improvement plan or whatever else. Right. Um, so the kind of managerial effort, managerial overhead is a lot. And that ends up taking a lot of your time. With an agency, you get to be very direct. You get to be very concrete, concise. And if they're not hitting the marks, you move on to the next one. Um, and typically that's not the way we think about hiring, um, people onto the team. Um, right. and, um, and so that's, but the alternative is hiring the team in house and allocate, you know, fewer dollars, um, than you otherwise would have to, to an agency. The other thing about an agency is that you can start small. So you can start with a portion of some creative person's time as opposed to needing to hire them fully. Um, yep. so those are kind of the trade-offs. I think if I were rethinking it, I probably would have, again, outside of our superpowers, started with small scale agency work. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the that's the creative angle. In the world of media buying, I don't, that's a good question. Um, I think there's some really talented people out there, but I've also seen some agencies that do, that charge you for doing a not very good job of managing your media. Um, and so you get burned on both ends because you're spending really inefficiently and they're taking a cut of that spend. Um, the modern toolkit with like uh, Facebook and Meta's Advantage Plus campaigns, Google's perform uh, Pmax campaigns, um, they're, they're trying to infuse more and more and more automation machine learning into this to frankly like help marketers not make major mistakes. Now, there are guardrails you have to put on those campaigns because you can't just blind trust um, in those, but they are toolkits that are getting better and better and better such that like the minutia of kind of keyword optimization, keyword targeting and exact match, phrase match, et cetera, long tail keyword, things like that in SEM 
is starting to become not quite as much um, the, the kind of um, power law as it used to be. Um, and then similarly on meta, like all the optimization and lookalikes and lookalike plus and lookalikes one through 20, like all that stuff is starting to get mushed into just let Facebook figure it out. <laughs> They've got great signal. They're working on this. And then how do you give them the right information and the right guardrails to make the best decisions for your business? That's important. But that oftentimes comes from the, the, the team, like the, the internal team. Um, now that, that is work. That is experience that you have to have. And so there are agencies out there that understand this dynamic. Um, um, but typically those are agencies that can, that can walk the walk in terms of showing you the contribution margin that they're growing for your business. Um, I think the other piece to this is most agencies are good at direct response marketing. Like media buying agencies tend to be really good at direct response marketing um, that, that we would have worked with at this stage. Yep. Um, and it's just a note, a note when you think about how to build brand that probably aren't many agencies out there that really understand the dynamics of building brand digitally um, in addition to building high ROAS campaigns and things like that, which I think right. you need both of at this stage to really, really find long-term profit growth. When you say you need both, need both the brand building components and the DR direct yeah. response performance marketing components. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How Those would are you the think about that need to go. Yeah. How would you think about approaching that, whether it be strategically or tactically from focus dollars, time, people perspective and, and would there be any differences from the same time in the Chubby's experience? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I was kind of rethinking this and were I kind of building again today, I think that I would have engines of growth for both the brand side and the direct response monetization side, right? So brand is how do I build more and more people who know who I am, what I do, what products I offer and have an emotional affect towards me that's positive. Um, so all of this like mental state and memory structure and all these sorts of things. And then that's half of the equation. And then the other half is making sure I'm there when they are ready to buy and I'm giving them really powerful, compelling opportunities to buy in ways that is in ways that are brand accretive as opposed to brand depletive. Um, so not heavy relying on promotions and things like that. Um, and so when I was thinking about kind of these engines, okay, there's this like content brand engine and depending on what you're trying to do, there are probably going to be different KPIs, but you want to understand how does this manifest in a way that I can track it every day or every week. So you have fast feedback mechanisms on yep. uh, that aspect. And so let's take social content. It's basically what are all of the engagements digitally that I'm hoping to revoke? What's their value? What is my efficient frontier? And how can I invest to build those? Use organic social as the guidepost. And so start posting a lot of interesting differentiated content on organic social. Find those things that drive your KPIs. Get those posts. Boost them. Promote them. Um, understand your cost purrs. And let that be kind of one of your engines, right? And then... Again, you're throwing in this like really differentiated content if that's what you've chosen, because that's what you're choosing to be best in the world at. And again, we've discussed it's non-negotiable. And then the, the framework is relatively simple. It's find what works, put money behind it, understand your costs, you understand your values, and uh, treat it as a sales and trading desk, right? You're, you're trying to pay under the kind of value of these things from a long-term and contribution perspective. Um, and spend as much as you can until you hit your efficient frontier marginally, and then stop, keep your spend there. Um, uh, so that's on the kind of brand front and specifically for social, and that paradigm exists across all of these um, different vehicles. Um, so there's this kind of a brand engine sort of thing. And so if I'm focused on packaging, it's, okay, how many shares am I expecting on this content? Um, how am I expecting this to come back in terms of growth in um, post-purchase surveys? Whatever it is, as I start to put more investment in this, I have to have some way to track it on a week-to-week -week basis. And that's one that you're probably tracking on a weekly basis. Um, so maybe it's searches, maybe it's mentions, it's shares, it's um, post-purchase surveys that you're targeting. Um, and as I try something new in the packaging and inbox, I want to see those things affected. Um, 
probably also doing some holdouts on LTV and things like that. So there's a kind of brand component. Then the direct response component is kind of composed of two ways of causing a response. One is paid and one is kind of organic direct response sort of stuff. So paid is ads. Um, and we don't need to dig too far into that um, um, because there's a lot of people who talk about that. Um, and then on the organic direct response, that's your kind of email SMS. And I think one of the things that I probably would have done differently is at Chevy's we were very heavily focused on batching blast. Um, and I think that was great, but it also got to a point where like, if you're going to do anything, you have to write a full, <laughs> brand new, a brand new, fresh piece of excellent creative every time and it has to hit every time and you're sending it to the whole list every time. But meanwhile, particularly like nine years in, 10 years in, whatever, the people you're acquiring have never seen any of the last nine years of content right. you've created. And that paradigm exists in every single business. And so how can you um, use uh, Batch and Blast to create and tee up excellent content that then you send automated flows through, right? And, and get customers automated messaging too, that then you can fine tune and dial for every segment for how much volume and frequency they need as opposed to the inverse where Batch and Blast is everything. That requires a massive team, massive infrastructure. Um, and it basically wastes a lot of that creative that you've created just sitting in the history books of great batch and bus campaigns that you sent out. Right. And so I would nail my, my paid direct response engine and understand the unit economics. I would, I would nail kind of the organic direct, uh, direct response engine and understand the unit economics there. And that's kind of growth, right? Um, gross margin is another kind of major lever. I would make sure that I have a path to 70 plus percent gross margins um, through my direct business of product, product margins. Um, and then work to keep kind of headcount um, minimized as a percentage of total, which like the way we were thinking about it is like, how much can you bring automation to bear to like to basically have your team composed of all freaking excellent heavy hitters in their relative domains, people who like, uh, you want to have equity value in the business, who have owner mindsets, all that stuff. And then once you're in this like tactical execution realm, using contractors, agencies, automation as much as you possibly can, um, it's kind of a framework to kind of think about it. And like rethinking the business that way, I think gives you a lot of leverage, gives you a lot of this capability of this becoming a great growing cash flow stream and ha having a high bar of whoever you bring into the fold, you have to have, they have to have an under mindset, they have to have an under stake sort of thing. Um, yep. So anyway, that's like a smattering of thoughts. The final what thing was, I would was, ask, go ahead. Well, you go ahead, we got four minutes. <laughs> I was just gonna say, final thing I would ask is, just, is, is folks who might just sort of say, hey, this, this organic thing, posting on my socials, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just take pictures that I've got from photo shoots or whatever and just, you know, I'll get my one post out a day and maybe I'll try to, a witty caption or something like that. But but really, I'm going to focus 95% of my time, energy, money on just, you know, just like nailing my ASC creative and because that's like the most obvious thing that is driving business for me, uh, not, not implying that any of that's bad, but just, are there some things that you might offer from a note perspective in terms of, you know, how to think about, um, maybe just short versus long-term, just things we've learned on that front. Um, or, yeah. or, or maybe just that's the path. Yeah. I think we, I think one of the things that we saw was, um, you can you can grow through short-term revenue optimization, right? Like one of the one of the beauty of, one of the beautiful things about platforms like Facebook and Google is anybody can start advertising there. Like historically, TV you required to invest like a 50k budget at least, um, and usually they were trying to push you to spend 100k because like you don't see any result from it unless you're spending lots of money, right? And so these platforms like Google, Facebook, etc., um, they allowed companies with an idea product to get going and get moving and buy revenue because there are people who are searching for those products 
that want to find the most interesting or best one. And new brands have one, they have novelty, right? They've, they have a look and feel just inherently, even if it's just a fashion item that no one's seen before. Um, and then two, they have this unique insight of being able to have a completely fresh take on this market. And so usually they're solving a new problem or whatever. Um, and so when they're bottom of funnel, a lot of times new brands are some of the most compelling opportunities and thus you start to buy revenue. Um, the hard part is maintaining that over time, right? So you can grow, a lot of brands will see short-term pop or like, and this is like varying degrees of life, life cycle because sometimes they'll figure out yep. the kind of the short-term revenue optimization and that's when they'll see their pop, but you'll see pops based on short-term. Great, you're getting better at monetizing, you're getting better at that value prop when somebody's ready to buy a bottom of a funnel. Um, but what we realize is you have to be balancing that out with more and more people understanding your brand, who you are, what you do, what products you sell, when they're not ready to buy, uh, or when they when they don't buy from you. Because like in any given, like the best ads in the world are clicking at you know one two percent maybe, um, and two uh, percent click through rates. Um, and so 98% of people aren't clicking, 98, 99% of people aren't clicking, right? So they're seeing the ad. And if the ad was just another among an array of products that they've seen, then that's not a lasting brand impression. Um, and then two, um, once they've clicked through, the vast majority are not buying, right? So maybe the best case scenario is you've got a 5% conversion rate or something like that on, on like ad clicks. Uh, which would be incredible. <laughs> right. And so 95% of those people aren't buying. So effectively 99.9% .9 of these people are not buying from you. Um, and it may be the case that your creative is already leaving them with excellent brand impressions, even though it's not converting. But a lot of times the sort of creative that works to convert people is very product heavy. It's very offer focused. It tells you the price. It's like the stuff that works to sell your product on like the Nordstrom shopping page, right? It's the product, it's the price, it's the features, it's photography that shows people wearing it, things like that. Um, but it's usually not storytelling. It's usually not an emotionally evocative thing that embeds itself in long-term memory. And that's why these disciplines have, have kind of found different kind of homes over the years where like in TV, the classic world of direct response marketing was like late night, <laughs> dial yep. the number sort of thing, product pitches and the world of brand was more emotional, 30 second spots, um, you know, big moments, et cetera. And I think there's a lot that both disciplines can learn from each other, but I think one of the notes is like the content is just different. Um, right. And so, uh, or it tends to be different. Sometimes you can have a win that goes both ways, but it's important to understand that it's not about top of funnel, it's not about bottom of funnel. Your customers don't know that this is a DR ad versus a brand ad, but it's, are you provoking a balance of actions. Are you provoking the actions that show you that you have, you're building long-term brand and building those memory structures? And are you also provoking those actions that are driving revenue today, shopping experiences today? And it's yep. the balance of those that grow over time. And so back to your question of, Hey, I'll just, I'll just take my ads and post them on organic social. If your ads are excellent at doing both of those things, sweet, you freaking yep. nailed it. I will say that's very hard to do and very atypical. And so, then it's, yeah, maybe you do half and half. Um, yep. Maybe you do some of your storytelling that drives these more brand actions. And then you take your DR things to provoke shopping and you figure out your brand's own balance. But I will say that extremism tends to not be super productive. If I'm only going to do top of funnel, tends to not be productive. I'm only going to do bottom of funnel, tends to not be productive. The most deceptive of those two is only doing bottom of funnel because you can grow. Uh, but what you'll find is profitability evades you and then you see that come down as competitors catch up they match your value prop they beat your price they're willing to take lower margins whatever yep gold gold thomas thank you this was this was awesome i think we've got uh we're gonna get a lot of folks when they see this their minds are gonna get blown their faces are gonna melt and they are going to tell their friends hopefully this so, sounds like a medical emergency. <laughs> Simple. Please go. Do you experience that? <laughs> Please, yes. Please Seek stop listening to podcasts. Medical professional medical mm. help. <laughs> yeah. Let us know after you you return from your hospital visit, <laughs> so we can take down the episode. Keep us keep us posted. Yes. Well, this was fun. I think very useful, and well, I hope. Let us know, people who listen, and. We'll try to, we're just going to try to keep mixing it up. Dabble with, Mix it up. 
with some of the most important foundational works on brand and brand building, talk about some current events, things that are happening in the world of brands and brand building today, do these things where we talk a little bit about maybe how we would do differently, things differently, reflecting on the experience, and then maybe even mix them all together. Who knows? But uh, for my good friend, best man at my wedding, Thomas Montgomery, this is Preston Shredder, WWE star in 2026 and beyond, Rutherford, signing off. Thanking you for your time today, joining us on the Brand Builders Podcast. Goodbye. I give